Hello, and welcome to Fresh Blood, a podcast about killing it in the age of ageism, where we prove that new blood does not necessarily equal young blood. I'll be your host, Jolie Downs. With over 20 years of executive recruiting experience, I've learned how much we need discussions around this issue. Thank you for joining us here on Fresh Blood. Today, I'm talking with Angela Hayden. Angela is a lawyer, entrepreneur, life coach, and author. With over 20 years practicing law, Angela has seen great success. She started her career working for various law firms before building her own law practice, as well as her own life coach consultancy. I'm excited to hear her story. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate you being here with us on Fresh Blood. Could you please share with us a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, I am a lawyer and a life coach and have to say, I never, ever thought that I would be saying both of those things or that they could ever coexist (laughs) for one person. I like this mix, life coach and lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and I, I started out my career as a lawyer in Boston's financial district and um, this was back in the, I graduated from law school back in 1999. So the early 2000s and, you know, deep into, um, you know, I think it was only a few years ago that I finally let go of that Boston address, even though I, mm. I started my own practice about 10 years ago and stopped wow. going in quite so frequently. But I'll tell you, I had a lot of black suits and a lot of pointy black, what I call my mean girl shoes, pointy toe yeah. black heels. And I loved to wear them because they made me angry when I went to court. So, Oh, you had the right uniform then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but not so much these days since the uh, COVID shutdown. <laughs> no, no. It's been um, interesting to see how both the courts and um, ADR, you know, arbitration and mediation has shifted. And, um, you know, I know plenty of us joke about Uh, how often we are dressed from the waist up and in our sweatpants and our pajamas Mm -hmm. (laughs) otherwise. So, um, you know, I guess we could wonder what the judges are up to too. But then again, I think we always (laughs) wonder what was going on under the robes. So, yeah. And now, uh, how did you become a life coach once you were a lawyer? How did that, that come to be for you? It happened over a really gradual evolution. I first started my own practice in in 2010. And I think that was when I really started to shift my own thoughts about what I wanted my life as a lawyer to be like and to look like and the things that I wanted in my my life that um, that were not just showing up to the office from nine to five, or actually I, I used to do a lot of litigation. So my days, I remember one day, during a trial, I showed up in the office at five, five thirty in the morning, and I was there until about two in the morning. So wow. I had, you know, oh, and then wow. back to the trial. So, so I did not want to live, continue living that type of lifestyle, and finally started to realize I could make my own changes, and just sort of stumbled into the concept of of coaching. Um, that really started, I would say, I when I, I got divorced, I filed for divorce back in 2015, and turned towards coaching to get me through that process. We had a very um, um, contentious at times, might be the right word, divorce. My Mm -hmm. ex-husband is a lawyer as well. We're all in a better much better place. But when you have four lawyers in the mix. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I can only imagine. Yes. That must have been a difficult time. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's where I really turned to coaching to get, to learn how to navigate and manage my own emotions that I had to work Uh, in the past to really teach my clients how to regulate. I needed help um, doing that for myself as a party to litigation. And uh, that's where I think the light bulb went on for me that I could actually utilize some of these coaching tools and coaching techniques to really help a lot of my clients. Um, You know, and I think really one huge uh, jump forward for me as a coach where I realized, wow, I actually could and, and maybe even should do this is I took a, a detour from my own um, private practice as a lawyer into the world of insurance. I worked in-house in an insurance company working with ski areas, which sounded like 
my dream job. <laughs> I love oh, to ski so and <laughs> I used to be a ski patroller and I love settling cases. I love helping people find middle ground. And it sounded like a great opportunity, but I, I did have um, clients and potential clients who would reach out to me for help, especially in the employment world um, and financial services, because there, there aren't a lot of lawyers around who really understand that industry and can help people um, navigate that process. So I had a lot of people who were still reaching out to me. I had friends in the financial services industry who were referring friends to me and I couldn't take their cases because I had a full-time job. But what happened mm -hmm. is I started coaching them through their transitions. Um, so that's... So it happened very naturally. Yes, yes. Naturally, organically, almost even accidentally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but something I... Something you enjoyed? I did. I enjoyed it. And I found that I was helping people get to some really good outcomes, even without having to file a case. Mm, so I think another, yeah, I think another light bulb moment there was, was understanding how impactful mastering our conflict resolution can be without having to resort to the lengthy and expensive court and arbitration system. Yes. The right communication can be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you mentioned something about how you realized you could make your own changes. And I, I found that to be powerful because I think a lot of us go through life reacting and not realizing that we are reacting and we can stop and make our own changes. What, what happened for you to make you realize that? Ooh, there's so many things that happen <laughs> that made me realize that. Are you willing to share? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, the first place that I go back to in my own mind and in my own history was really during my divorce because that was, I think, the first time in my life where there are some really important things that were going to affect my life and my kids' lives that really weren't out of my control, or that, that really weren't within my control, that were really out of my control. I couldn't control what my ex-husband did. I couldn't control what his lawyer did. I couldn't control what the judge would ultimately do. So I really had to dig down and focus on what I could control and learn how to make my peace with what I couldn't. And that's where I really began to understand that we, not just I, I learned it for myself at that point, And that soon transitioned into seeing that we all have that ability to create our life and to make massive, massive changes. Even when we think we can't, even when we think we're stuck. Absolutely. It makes me think of the, uh, this great question the, to ask yourself, if, if I can't change this situation, what can I change about myself to bring me peace? I've always loved that. Oh, I love that too. And I, I think of, I always think of um, Byron Katie and I can't remember which book it was by her, but she talks about your stuff, you know, the things that you can control and the things that you can't. So you have your own stuff, there's other people's stuff. And then there's, I'm using air quotes here, God's stuff. And God mm -hmm. doesn't have to be God in the religious sense. It's just, you know, anything outside of my stuff and someone else's stuff, just the stuff that's out there in the universe. And the only thing you can control is your own stuff. Nobody yeah. else is. <laughs> so. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And staying focused on that is, is, is much more helpful than the alternative. So what would you say has been your greatest success and, and, and what did you learn from it? This may sound like kind of an odd answer to that question, but my greatest success has been changing my idea of success. I like this <laughs> so, more. I, I look back um, to the beginning of my career, which has now been over 20 years. And I had just a few years out of law school, I had some really amazing case wins and case settlements that looked like amazing success. We, we, had, um, we received a million dollar jury verdict in a defamation wow. case, which... Yeah, that's big. Most lawyers never have the experience of sitting in a courtroom and hearing a jury say that they're giving your client a million dollars because of yeah. the work that you've done. Yeah. That was unbelievable. Big. 
that same year, I, we settled a case that, um, that had come in through me um, for, it was an investment related case where our client, who is really one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever met, um, had lost about $25 million in a very well-documented, complete screw up <laughs> really, um, by a brokerage firm. And, and we resolved that case. And so that was, that was a very, very nice fee that came into our firm that year. So, um, those were things that, uh, and I actually got some, some press that had come to me through the Boston Bar Referral Association. And that was, um, the referral fee that was paid to them from that client was the biggest they had ever received. And they were able to do a lot of good with that money. Um, and that was 10 times more than the next largest referral fee that oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. So that that's was a real, I mean, so that was like, wow, this is great. Like I'm killing this. This is awesome. <laughs> And, you know, then I, had, uh, then I had kids and, you know, I, I, it took me a while to sort of shift into what really does success feel like. Um, and it, it took me quite a few years to realize that success to me now is, is really more about building and maintaining meaningful connections, um, feeling good about the impact that I'm having on the people that I work with and that I work for feeling good about the way that I settle cases. Um, you know, even when I worked in insurance, I would go up, I, I did a lot of mediations in Toronto. I worked with a lot of, um, of Canadian uh, resorts. And so I would go up there and there were times where I, I would settle a case and I would get a hug on the way out the door. <laughs> I was like, wow. That's satisfying. Yes. Usually people in insurance don't get hugs. So, so that, that felt good. And it felt like I was, but it was because I was settling those cases, you know, in a, in a compassionate way. It wasn't just like, here's your money. You're going to take what you're going to get and deal with it. It was like, Hey, listen, this is, this is the reality, but, um, no, so that's that, great. I, think, I consider that my greatest success is really shifting away from making, just making money to like actually resolving problems in a way that's great for everybody involved. Oh or yeah. It's the best yeah. possible outcome. It may not be great for everybody, but it's the best possible outcome. The best possible outcome and building those strong relation, authentic relationships, feeling good about the work that you're doing. It, it provides you that self-satisfaction that, that leaves you kind of glowing, if you will, at the end of the night. Yes, I agree. And, and I have to say kudos to you because uh, I've never had a desire to hug my insurance people. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, so I'm, that still, is I'm, I'm still friends with a lot of people I worked with and I still hug them. So it's all good. There's, there's still some huggable insurance people. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about the opposite? Can you tell me about a time that you failed or, you know, I hate that word, failed, dealt with an obstacle, made a mistake and, and, and what you learned from it? <laughs> oh, I mean, there's so, so many possible answers to that question. Well, if you're successful, there's lots of, <laughs> there's lots of <laughs> yeah. and obstacles that you climbed over to get there. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I think that this, this question, what I like about this is it kind of goes back to the idea of the definition of success. I've also shifted my thoughts about what is a failure. And mm -hmm. I, um, I play a lot of tennis. I, I love to play tennis <laughs> and I fail a lot when I play tennis. Uh, I come in second many times. You um, can play me next time. Absolutely. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> come on out. Um, but there, there was a podcast I was listening to about tennis. And I, I think this phrase shows up in lots of different places too, but, um, but I remember it in the context of tennis, which is there's never, there's, there is no failure there's only feedback. Mm. And, um, you know, so I, I, I've definitely shifted my own relationship with the concept of failure, but, um, you know, obstacles and mistakes, I certainly, I make them, I mean, I'm sure I make them every day. Um, but one thing that comes to mind, it's really almost comical. Um, when I, I restarted my law practice and in, in the current iteration that it's in, which is very much, I mean, if you ever look at my website, it is decidedly not a downtown Boston financial district lawyer's website. <laughs> it's yeah, very good, sort of good. holistic. You're, you're unique. Yeah, it's definitely a lot more sort of touchy feely. I don't know. I don't know if touchy feely is the word, but um, it's a lot more. What I've been told by clients and potential clients is that I seem a lot more approachable. It's not just about 
I, I know the law and I do cases. So, um, but I remember as I shifted my practice and, and I did this a while ago, I shifted from litigation to more estate planning, which really is a much more, um, you know, I hate to use the word spiritual because I think it's so often confused with religious and that can carry a lot of charge for a lot of people that I don't intend to elicit, but, but mm-hmm. it is a lot more spiritual having conversations with people about their, you know, their life and their death and what, you know, their family relationships and all those screwed up things that they don't tell people that's going yeah. on in their family. It's definitely a very different type of practice, but the marketing of it is very different. And I remember all of these marketing fails I had when I was trying to shift from this, this, I'm a litigator. And when people find me, they need a lawyer. It's just which lawyer they they're going to hire to estate planning where, you know, everybody benefits from estate planning. So, but convincing people that it's time to do it is, you know, sometimes cited as a difficult part of being in this practice area, but I just remember having so many almost embarrassing like events that I would schedule and they wouldn't get marketed properly. Or there was one where I had, I think 12 people registered and one person showed up and I had this big room and all this food. (laughs) And I was like, hi, how are you? I'm like, hi, there, there are three of us here to talk to just you. (laughs) So weird and awkward. (laughs) But thank you so I, for sharing that because I can't, I mean, I know we have all had those moments. <laughs> it just makes you feel less alone. I was like, really? There were like 12 people registered. I don't know where they all are. But, but <laughs> what I learned from that was to just sort of like relax and chill and smile. And we ended up having a really nice conversation. And I, I literally just like, and the, and the screen wasn't working very well for my PowerPoint that I'd spent hours mm-hmm. preparing. That was the second time in my life that had happened. And so I just put the computer away and we just sat and we had a chat and it was great. And I learned so much more about the the person who did show up and really had a great conversation with her. So I think that's fantastic. And I know if I was looking for a lawyer, a personable person like yourself is exactly the type of person that I would want to hire. I also just love that relaxed, chill and smile. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> I th- I, well, thank you for sharing that. And I, I think that, um, I think people are looking for that more and more. I certainly get that feedback that um, a lot of the clients who come to me are are interested in that. They're attracted to working with me because I present that more approachable and more relaxed um, type of approach. I don't have to sit in the conference room in the mean girl shoes and tell them how smart I am. Nobody cares. I mean, everyone assumes that the lawyer is smart enough to have passed the bar. So <laughs> nobody wants to hear about us. <laughs> And then now with your lawyer coaching, is it essentially when you started your own company and you went through this process of learning how to do everything, did you just take all of the aspects of what you learned and applied it to your coaching to help people do the same? Yeah. So, so in my, in my coaching business, so I do coach lawyers. I also, it also is broader than that as well. I find myself coaching a lot of um, professionals as well who are getting to the point of burnout and want to stop doing their profession and buy a farm and raise goats, which was kind of what <laughs> took me to New Hampshire. I never got the goats, but I got the urge to get the goats out of my system. <laughs> lots of things you can do with them, including yoga. Absolutely. I love it. Oh my gosh. I love it. And make pajamas for them. Oh, they're so cute. Baby goats. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I, so I work with people too, and trying to, to help professionals figure out how to stay in their profession. Because I, I think whenever we start searching for more meaning in what we're doing or more meaning in our lives, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to stop being in financial services or we need to stop being a lawyer or we need to stop, you know, being in marketing or stop whatever. I think it's often a sign that we just need to bring that more into alignment with who we are. And so I, I really, really love working with people on that. And that happens a lot with lawyers as well. But um, the coaching that I've done with with other lawyers is kind of, I guess, is kind of the compilation of the failures that I've had. Where I've tried, uh, I've tried a few different marketing programs because I didn't feel like I knew how to market an estate planning practice. And the the I think this happens with a lot of entrepreneurs too. That there's a a lot of um, marketing teaching out there that 
says you really have to do all the things. You have to write the blog and you have to do this and you have to do the Instagram posts and you, you know, hire these people mm-hmm. or do it yourself. And, yep. you know, here's your strategy and here's your marketing calendar. And my brain just got so overwhelmed with that. My body got really overwhelmed with it too. Like I started getting sick trying to do all these things in a really short period of time. And I finally pulled the plug on some of the expensive things that I was paying for that were just not getting me where I wanted to go. I felt like they were pushing me to a place of overwhelm that I didn't want to be. And it was so it to paralyze you. Yeah. And it was so antithetical to what I was trying to create for myself as a lawyer by giving up that Boston financial district lawyer identity and, and moving my practice to New Hampshire. And so what I, what I teach, what I try to teach other lawyers now is that you can have a really simple infrastructure that's effective and you can automate a lot of, of repeated processes without losing that connection to your client. And you can really, you know, just make your life a lot easier. So that's, that's what I do um, in terms right. of coaching other lawyers is you can really yes. make it easier and lower the overhead too. Oh yeah. my gosh, it's amazing how much we can lower our overhead and still be good lawyers and still have a good interface with our clients. Yeah. Looks, I mean, automation is infiltrating most industries at this point and making a lot of different things easier. So that's great. Yeah. And I feel like the legal profession is always really slow to adopt a lot of changes. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I had one lawyer who came to me saying, you know, I don't know about this class you're going to teach. I think that um, you know, you're talking about cloud server, you know, keeping stuff in the cloud and the bar association really doesn't like that. And I said, well, so the, the program that I use is called Clio, C-L-I-O, and it's, it's um, endorsed by many, maybe even all bar associations at this point. I don't even know what the numbers are, but I know that for my state, our bar association recommends it. So I have a hard time and, and they, you know, obviously they have their own cloud servers. So I can't imagine that the bar would have an issue with us using their product <laughs> that they yeah. recommend. So, <laughs> so he's like, oh, oh, good point. Yeah. Oh, now he's like, now he's like free and able to, you know, let his life be easier instead of being stuck in this place of believing that nothing will work to make his life easier. So that was actually a really big um, unfolding for that particular mm-hmm. client. And that was really cool to see that just by one little tiny thought shift. And all of a sudden he's like, oh, my whole life can be easier. This is great. Opens up <laughs> mind, doesn't it? Yeah. So from your experience, and because everyone has a different experience, I'd love to know what you believe to be key to continued success in life. Yeah, I think the real key to boil it down to one simple key to success in life is knowing and trusting and believing that you have the ability to create your life, that you're the one in control. You can figure anything out that you need to. So all, you always have the power to change. I love that. And it's something that we sometimes need to be reminded of. Now, have you ever experienced ageism in the workplace yourself or seen it? So both I have, I have seen it in both contexts. Um, in terms of the ageism, I think personally, I experienced it more when I was younger, where I would not be taken seriously when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, I experienced it myself after as well, after I moved to New Hampshire and began looking for jobs with law firms in New Hampshire I found that the offers were either the offers that were made to me were not really, it really didn't make sense to where I was in my career. So Mm -hmm. I was either, I felt like I was either being underpriced um, or that I was sort of expected to carry the weight of somebody else's retirement. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I don't think they would have put that on the shoulders of an associate two or three years out of law school, but I, I don't know. I mean, it, it may have been a little bit, I, I felt like it was a little bit of sexism as well playing mm-hmm. into that experience. Was um, it mostly male firms? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Male firms or male, very small or, or solo practitioners. And, um, it just did not feel like the right fit. The other, um, thing that happened is I didn't get call, I mean, I had my, the year that I graduated from law school, um, out there. And so there were a lot of positions that I felt like I was absolutely a great fit for and didn't even get a phone call. So 
you know, is that ageism per se? I don't know. People may have been assuming, oh, she came from Boston. She's been practicing for all these years. We, we can't afford her. That could have been going on. So who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't knows? know, but I, yeah. But I can tell you that a lot, yes, the years, the years do make a difference on, on the phone calls, yeah. <laughs> depending on the role and the company, but it can make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've seen it. I've seen it a lot in the financial services employment cases that I've worked on over the years. I've seen it again and again and again. And um, I know I'm not the only lawyer who's had that experience. I've seen, I've, I know one expert in particular who's worked on many of these cases. Uh, he and I had a chat not, not too long ago, uh, definitely within the last year, um, about something that happens. I think it's un- it, it feels unique to financial services, but I think it happens elsewhere where, you know, as, as somebody has worked in a firm for a long time, they tend to increase their client base and they tend to have a higher payout for the work that they do. And so sometimes they get kind of pushed out the door. I've seen yeah. these cases more than once. We call it the tag and bag. Yes. Um, where they... Um, start getting written up for things that are just ridiculous, like failing to put something in their calendar in the exact format mm-hmm. <laughs> that the new mm-hmm. procedure requires them to do. Um, and so, the, you know, people would start getting written up and then they get fired and they get fired and on their, for, in financial services, um, the firms have to file a termination of registration statement with FINRA, with the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And that then becomes a part of the the financial services reps public record. Oh wow! So, yeah, so that part is called the U five. It's the termination statement. And so, what happens is the firms will say, "Oh, well, they got fired for violating a firm policy," but they don't specify. They often don't specify what kind of firm policy. They don't say that we fired them because they didn't, make, you know, make their calendar entry correct. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. So you know, we did. We, we might have fired them for stealing money, but we're not really going to specify. So you get to guess. <laughs> so if you're thinking oh, about working with them, <laughs> it's up to you to guess. Um, and so what happens is then the firms will keep a lot of that, that person's client base, and then they'll redistribute them to younger reps who are getting a lower payout. So the firms yeah. can keep more of their money. So um, that's something that I think, that's an industry where I think that ageism still happens a lot. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's very rough. And, and being a, being one that has seen a lot of these cases, have you witnessed or do you have any views on how one can overcome this issue if they're dealing with it? In, in the financial services industry in particular? No, I just mean in general. Uh, in general? <laughs> yeah. You know what? I mean, <laughs> my thoughts on that have, have shifted as well over the years. And I, I think that... Um, you know, it's part of it, I think, is just maintaining really good relationships with the people that you work with, mm-hmm. um, being aware of what's happening around you. I mean, some of this stuff happens because there's been a change in management above above the people and there's nothing that they could do because that person wants to bring in their new team. So there, there really isn't in some circumstances. But I think for the most part, um, you know, if a company or a firm is looking to cut some costs because of changes in the economy or changes in their revenue, they start looking for reasons to get rid of people. So if you just kind of just do the best that you can and have good relationships, that's that's one way to combat that internally. And then externally, I think it's just making sure that you have a really good network within your industry um, around you. I, I see that um, some industries are better at fostering that external networking. So, you know, as a lawyer, and generally speaking, if I had stayed in Boston and was looking to find a job in Boston, I could have made lots and lots of phone calls and I probably would have landed somewhere pretty easily. But trying to, to break into an entirely new um, geographic area was a lot different. That was a different place. So, um, but you know, so other industries, engineers, engineers never seem to talk to each other. <laughs> they don't socialize right. outside of their workplace. I, 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 they I should be connecting. <laughs> You're asking, right? That's a really, it's a really good tip, actually. Um, that's interesting. Now, what about if someone was struggling they're in their forties, fifties, sixties, if you will, this, something like this happened, you know, and this happens in other industries, not just the financial industry, mm-hmm. maybe slightly pushed out and struggling to find that right next opportunity. Is there any advice that you would give someone who found themselves in that position? Yes. I think that 
that is a great opportunity that a lot of people take to think about doing something else. Sometimes people really want to stay in an in, in industry or stay in a job or, or retain a license, especially, you know, I see this again in financial services a lot where that's a profession that requires licensing and people get very resistant to giving that up. And so I have had so many clients over the years who really didn't want to give up that license. Yeah. And say, well, listen, let's just pretend that you don't have to worry about that. What do you want to do for yourself? Because now's your chance to do that. You know, take your severance, take your severance package, take your, take the the settlement that I'm going to help you get and, and get out there and use that and take that opportunity to, to go create what you want for the next stage in your life. Think about what, you know, the impact that you want to leave on the world, the legacy you want to leave, where do you want to be? Do you want to pick up and move? So it's just, I think really trying to shift from that, oh my gosh, yeah. I just got fired or I'm about to get fired into the, oh, this is actually an opportunity. So shifting that mindset. Yeah. Good question. What would you do? What would you do if you didn't have to worry about that? Mm-hmm. Mm, and all the answers that come up. Very yeah. good. I love it. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, Angela. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you would want to share? Oh boy. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, dealing, dealing with ageism or dealing with unexpected um, changes or challenges in the workplace, that the best thing that all of us can do to deal with that or word against it is really reminding ourselves and checking in with who we are and what we want to be and staying connected with the people that um, that we care about and contacts and, you know, just keeping options open, but approaching them with an open mind. Yes. No, that's great advice all around. You need to know yourself, you need to know your connections and have strong, good connections, continuously building those. Mm-hmm. And, tr- and trust that everything's going to work out. Every single person that I've worked with over the years who thought that it was really the end of the world for them, every single one of them has ended up in a better place. Every you single one. Absolutely. Some of them it right. two jobs, but, yeah. <laughs> but everybody, one in particular, it took three shots, but, um, but they've all ended up in a better, better place. And they're so much more happy and they're so much more connected with their family and they're, they're doing so many cool things in their communities. So everybody has ended up in a, not just on their feet again, but in a better place. Such an important point. Such an important point. And you're absolutely right. I can say after over 20 years of recruiting, this is the third downturn I've gone through. I have seen countless people struggle in trying to find that that next right thing and 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 get very anxious and it, there's a lot of negative emotions that churn up and and every single time that person ends up exactly where they're supposed to be. And so that's what we all need to remember. It will be it'll be okay. Let's all take a well, deep breath. And there's one other thought around that too. Sorry, I was share earlier, but <laughs> but the um, you know one other thought about that is that when something like a job change happens, when when someone gets fired or they get laid off, it's really easy for people to think that that's about them and to take it personally and to feel like they personally have been rejected, and it may not be about them, and so finding this is, all goes back to that positive mindset, like finding the things that make you feel good. If that's happened, mm-hmm. finding, you know, reminding yourself that you are worthy, that you do have good qualities, that you do have great skills is so important in terms of self-care when going through that, like you have to find what makes you feel good. So important every day, every day. Yes. Not just when you get fired. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Especially when you get fired, but every day you do need to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. (laughs) So this was fantastic. So many great takeaways, Angela. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. I loved Angela's story. There are so many important lessons that she shared with us. A common theme among her story is taking time out to really think about and realize what she wanted her life to look like, what she wanted her lifestyle to be. And then she went ahead and made those changes. We are the architects of our own lives. 
We must know what we want in our plan if we're going to build our masterpiece. Clarity is power. So take the time to ask yourself, what do I really want? When Angela went through a difficult time in her life, maneuvering through a divorce, which let's be real, can shake the foundation of your livelihood. She found life coaching and personal development to help her through that painful process and manage her emotions. She went out there and found the tools to help her get through the tough times. Those tools were so powerful in her life, she naturally started using the techniques on her clients and found a new path organically. She shared what she learned and by doing so, created new areas of growth and opportunity in her life. What has helped you? What do you know or what can you do that you can pass along to others? Who knows what doors may open? Angela found that when dealing with things out of her control, she had to learn to dig deep and keep her focus on what she could control while making peace with what she couldn't. This is such an important lesson because we are all currently dealing with really big things very much outside of our control. There are so many things we can't change at the moment. And if we keep our focus on those things that we can't change, we will sink. But if we keep our focus on the positive changes that we can make within ourselves, we will soar. Ask yourself, If I can't change this current situation, what can I change about myself to help me find peace? I loved that Angela felt her greatest success was changing her idea of success. I want us to all sit with that for a moment. This is a woman who made huge settlements for her clients, who accomplished those big career successes that you set out to make when you are wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. But that is not what she defines as success. To her, success is maintaining strong connections, feeling good about the work that she does, feeling good about the impact she has on life, how she composes herself, how she makes compassionate, authentic connections, and works to resolve problems in a way that is in the best outcome for everyone. This is success. It's my definition, at least self-satisfaction, being able to feel truly good about who you are as a person. I also love that Angela shifted her thoughts on what is failure. It was glossed over quickly in our talk, but it needs additional focus. Angela said she believes that there is no failure, only feedback. I agree a hundred percent. And I tell this to my kids all the time. I want to see them fail. Failing means that they are trying, and trying means that they are growing. No one expects them to not fail. We only expect that they learn from their mistakes. I loved Angela's example of a time when things didn't work out quite as she had planned, but she did not let that get her down. She relaxed. She chilled. She smiled. She went with it, learned from it, and moved on. No failure, only feedback. Angela shared how she went through her own hard time finding the right role for her when she moved to a new area. The offers weren't coming in that were true to her expertise and ability. Instead of accepting something that would have diminished her, she reminded herself that she is the creator of her own life and went out and started her own practice. I love it. Now, we know ageism happens in the corporate world, and Angela had good suggestions here. Maintain those strong relationships with the people within your company. Stay aware of what's going on around you and make sure that you are networking and growing your connections in your industry on a consistent basis. Even if you feel good, keep growing that network. Getting pushed out of a role can happen for so very many reasons. Be prepared as best as possible. It will only benefit you in the long run. She also points out that it's okay to make a change. And this is important to remember, if you're struggling to find that right next role, maybe use it as an opportunity to check in with yourself. Make sure you know what it is that you really want to do. 
Sometimes we go through these periods because life is trying to tell us it's time for a course correct. If there is something that is singing to your soul, listen. What would you do if you could do anything? Who do you really want to be? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? We can redefine these answers at any age, and we should continue to redefine them at various ages. I want to leave you now with important parting words from Angela. Trust that everything will work out. Everyone she knows who thought that it was the end of their career ended up in a better, happier place. If you are going through this process, remind yourself to feel good about all the things that make you, you. Remind yourself that you are worthy and know that everything will work out. You will end up exactly where you should be in that very right place. Thank you for spending your time with me. Until next time. Thank you for spending time with us on Fresh Blood. If you love this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, or giving us a review. I'm looking forward to connecting with you again on the next episode.